Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Straight Talk Vermont Show. I'm Bruce Wilson, Executive Director of Service Render Incorporated. Straight Talk Vermont is one of our programs. Before I talk to my wonderful guests, I want to uh, make some, a couple announcements about our um, gallery. We have a gallery at the University of Vermont called Art So Wonderful. And it's open every day, pretty much every day. at the, and So come in and check out our, our art. The University Mall is open from 11, um, 10 to 7. And every Sunday, we're doing free art at City Market in um, the City Market on Flynn Avenue. So today, I'm very fortunate to have these wonderful ladies on the show to talk about um, equity and inclusion, and racial equity and inclusion, and justice and diversity. So let's start off with, to my right. I want to introduce you to, to um, Yasmin Gordon and Taisha Green and Aaron McGuire. So um, I guess my first question would be, um, how did you start this work? How did you start this work, Yasmin? Oh, how did I start this work? Well, I started it by growing up in Montpelier, Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my family moved here when I was 10 from Florida, and we moved to Montpelier the summer of my fifth grade year, and I was the only student of color in my entire middle school. Um, and so, you know, my family being one of very few families, in, you know, of color growing up in Montpelier, you know, had some experiences and it got, you know, us as siblings had to kind of get used to a really different environment than what we had known from our, you know, the, the beginning of our childhood in uh, just outside Tampa, Florida. Um, so that was really the beginning of my work. The beginning of my professional work began um, after high school when I went to college in Dublin, Ireland. And I worked for a nonprofit um, organization there that housed unaccompanied minors in residential units. So I was working with a lot of immigrants and new Americans, um, new American youth, or a new, new, they actually weren't Americans because we were in, we were in Ireland, but I was working with immigrant youth um, in residential situations where they were alone um, and had not come and gotten to the, to the country with their families. And so um, part of my job as a child care worker in that situation was helping them kind of integrate into the westernized into Irish society, um, helping them through the asylum seeking process, you know, helping them enroll in schools and kind of um, integrate into the city. And so, you know, that was challenging. It was a lot of fun and it was a great experience, but it really started to open my eyes into the ways that the system was actually um, kind of hindering their progress and slowing things down for them. So that was really kind of the beginning of my journey into oh, this work. Did you say Dublin? Yes. So um, how long did you stay there? Four years. I was there all through my undergrad. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so that, that was interesting, like you just said, right? Yes. I always wanted to go to Ireland and see those, uh, those um, rolling green. Oh, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it looked just as pretty as it is in all the books. Oh, man. <laughs> I got to go there one day. <laughs> Deisha Green, please tell us about, you know, um, you get a little short bio or yeah. how you work and about yourself. I feel like I learned a little bit about Yasmin, like <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> so we gotta talk. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay. My name is Taisha Green. I am the Director of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for the City of Burlington. I started this work, like Yasmin, as a child, um, just growing up in segregated Kankakee, Illinois, and then coming back through to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, just, you know, being a black kid in, in white spaces. So uh, my training, my formalized training um, earlier in my career was IT. Mm -hmm. So I worked in IT for about 20 years and being the only black mm -hmm. woman, the only black person in IT for my entire 20 years really helped me to uh, understand the magnitude of the issue it wasn't until I heard President Obama's um, farewell speech that I signed up to go back to school, get my master's in racial justice and my MPA in racial justice. And so I did that, finished that up in 2019. And here in 2020, I'm in Burlington doing this work. Um, I was doing it as an IT person at the city of Bloomington in, in Minnesota, just uh, trying to push forth racial equity and racial justice. Um, I don't work on diversity, I never have. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, diversity is a very broad topic, it can mean anything, which means it means nothing. Um, so I work on racial equity, racial inclusion, and racial belonging. And that's just a little bit about me. Wow, so uh, we talked before, you know, like I, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, 
And um, we have properties, and uh, my folks build these summer homes in Moments, Illinois, and Kankakee, Illinois. So I just go to Kankakee all the time, because we just go there and get the feed for the chickens and all this cool stuff. And uh, and so I miss I miss I miss Kankakee <laughs> and uh, the Kankakee River. We used to do some fishing there. Oh yeah, yeah. they have some good catfish in Kankakee mm -hmm. River. Or they used to. I don't know about now. Yeah. Like the you know things have been kind of toxic in Kankakee River oh, right really? now, but. Yeah. yeah. It's pretiful. I think it was look like one of the freshest rivers around. Yeah, back in the day, of course. Of and then course. you um you 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 did some you did you go to school in um, Minnesota? I did. I did my did all my schooling in Minnesota, my oh. undergrad and my graduate school. Oh. In so I, I I lived in um, Minnesota for three years with that worked with Honeywell doing a um, you know, working with Honeywell doing some work and I was, yeah. I lived in Golden Valley in the in um Minneapolis. Right, right, or, right. We got a track record here. Again. We do, we do. We got some, we got some connections here. So, <laughs> well, for, you know, well, go, country. yeah. Well, I'm getting, went to Ireland again. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't do that. <laughs> we didn't do that, but. Yeah, I was gonna show us around. Yeah. So, Erin McGuire. Yes. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank Please, you for having um, me. Um, give us a little bio and um, how did you get into the work you're doing? Sure. Um, you know, I think similarly to um, many white Vermonters, I have observed severe systemic racism, direct uh, racism to individuals and microaggressions to people I care deeply about um, throughout my childhood and throughout my time um, in Vermont. And I also have um, very strong connections um, familially into the LGBTQI plus community. And so those have driven me since I was a young person in this in this work um, I entered education in um, when I was in my 20s and um, focused in on special education and I've been in special education working on issues of ensuring people with disabilities have access to education um, now for about 22 years um, and that continues to be an important part of my work and um, in in this role of equity and inclusion I am um, I received a master's degree on special ed and then um, moved into a doctoral program and I would say that that's where um, my formal study of equity and inclusion work came to be and um, did that through UVM and I'm still in that process and um, had the opportunity to um, do some work with the Essex Westford School District in equity and inclusion. This is, I'm going into my third year of focus formally in that way but have been uh, really trying hard to move the educational system related to inequities um, in, in multiple ways and with a race first lens um, on that topic, um, really probably for a good 10 to 15 years um, and have made probably the most movement over the last year or so, I'm sure we'll get into that part of the conversation. But um, I also just, you know, I think my my work is something that I'm always thoughtful of related to my own identities and privileges that I bring into any space. And um, I'm, I'm really thoughtful about that. And I think it makes my work look a little bit different. Um, my own lived experiences are, um, are, are, are not um, marginalized traditionally. And so um, I think that um, through the conversation Maybe we can explore a little bit of that, but it is important as it relates to my own work in this space and what that looks like. Wow, those are great answers. Um, so, so you you you, um, you you work in Essex. I do work in and, Essex, um, and um, I, I work in Essex too. So you know, yeah. respect for many years, I worked with the high school and and different things around town and just yeah. had a big meeting today with the S's people. You that's know. good, that's <laughs> good. Talk really good about you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they say some good that's stuff. That's good. I, I, I think, you know, I appreciate that. I do <laughs> think the, um, and I appreciate being here, but I, you know, uh, this work is definitely not a, about centering myself. Sure, um, and hopefully I can share some things that Essex is doing mm -hmm. um, sure. and supporting BIPOC and uh, the disability community and the LGBTQI community and having voice and representation in this body of work because that's really yeah, definitely you're, what you're this more is about. Broad than, um, than, um, like, a, like Marguerite does some. Uh, some type of equity and inclusion, or CEE, I don't forget what the acronym stands for. Yeah, the, community. the community on equity for Essex. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, and I asked her, and I sent an email, I said, you know, I get, you know, I read over what the objectives are, but I asked her, I said, Marguerite, now when, I, when people usually use, when I hear the word equity, I usually hear 
inclusion, equity, you know what I'm saying? So how do you go, how do you, uh, I mean, she wrote me this long email, and which, which is awesome, she gave me what she, what she had. And I said, I didn't see inclusion in there, nowhere in, in there, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? But that is my little brain just trying to, mm -hmm. you know, figure stuff out. And so, so you see, uh, uh, Ariel works with um, uh, Tabitha Poo Moore mm -hmm. and Keisha Ram. She got a, she got a, you got a great team working with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the people who are um, most important to center in the conversation while we have some incredible consultants are the people of our community who have done some really incredible work to provide the school system clarity about what needs to happen um, around equity and inclusion at, at Essex Westford School District. So how many schools in your district? There are 10 schools in our ten school schools. district. And mm -hmm. then what is, what is the, like middle school, high school, uh, what's, what's the? So there are, um, there are uh, two sister elementary schools in um, Essex Junction and there's, um, then there are, uh, there's one in Essex Town, there's a, a, a Westford K-8 building there are some um, three four five buildings um, one in the town and one in the junction um, and then we have um, two middle schools and essex high school as well as the center for technology essex wow and so uh part of your i know we talked about this um before the show is um tr getting trainings to people how that work again how that work how do people get trained around equity and inclusion how, how did that work so you know, um, one of the things that we started with was really understanding um, what uh, the people, the students of the school really wanted to see us do, um, as well as community members and parents. Um, and we have, oh, sorry, okay. Uh, we have um, taken thoughts from them and really centered our training on ensuring teachers have the skills to do a couple of things. One is ha be able to have courageous conversations about race when that is um, something that's r really important to be able to make sure that the materials that teachers are using to teach with are representing everyone um, and not in disproportionate ways. And then also to make sure that um, teachers are able to teach through multiple lenses. So when we talk about teaching any, whether it's a fictional story and making connections to it, or whether it's about a historical event that all of the people who were there are represented equally and that um, there isn't one perspective that um, situates itself over top of another. And, um, and the training that's necessary is really curriculum auditing with an equity lens. Um, and we are using really reputable people who know this work really well to train all of our teachers. All of our teachers will experience that training this year, as well as Courageous Conversations, which is Glenn Singleton's work um, out of the Pacific Education Group. So we're just trying to make sure to provide teachers with training that will allow them to have the skills they need to be culturally agile and um, and culturally sustaining for our students and families. So how many teachers you think have already taken the training to your school district? How many, how many? How think? many teachers yeah. have taken training related to, well, yeah. we've, we've done implicit bias training for uh, everyone, okay. so, but that's not anywhere, like that's just a very beginning, mm. right? I mean, um, so that has happened. And uh, there are probably about 400 people who have had Courageous Conversations training. Um, and then um, we have um, done sort of a whole variety of book reads. We've read um, Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, as well as, um, white fragility as an opportunity for teachers to read. There are no, I mean, I, you know, could yeah. keep going and going. I don't have an exact no, number just, for I'm you, but. <laughs> no, I'm just, because I don't know, because the reason why I asked that question is because in, um, in my, in, what I see equity inclusion, I believe, you know, I, I haven't seen it all my life in positions around the country. I have, I have not yeah. seen it. And so that's just me, but so, I'm asking because I think it's kind of new to Vermont yeah. equity and inclusion. They well, added it to uh, 
the curriculum or attitude of company policy or procedures and fair and partial policing and all these different things. So, I, so I ask you that mm -hmm. because it's fairly new. Not to say now, I'm just curious how many. No, I'm not to say that you should have done as Tom. Uh, well, I know that teachers should have been trained. I know that Yasmin has also been in schools quite a bit and has a great deal of experience working in schools. I don't know if maybe um, yeah, we'll, she we'll would be. Answer. Yeah. 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 Or you can talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I do think that there's, like you said, that there's, uh, you know, a trend that is happening where um, folks mm -hmm. are really starting to understand the importance of this work. Um, and the, to, uh, people are really starting to understand the importance of not necessarily, um, you know, just just stopping at training yeah. and just stopping at, um, you know, at, at looking at book reads and things like that, but really looking at systems change now. Um, and I think that that's the that's an important piece in this work um, because we know that systemic racism exists and we know that that has been something that we have all, you know, people of color and people who are up underrepresented have been um, kind of victims of for a very, very long time now. And the focus, you know, is starting to begin to shift at really looking at policies and procedures and how we are implementing um, the policies and procedures and how who they are really affecting and who they're really truly meant for. And I think that, you know, public education in Vermont has really started to take that turn. Okay. Um, I came from CVSD, um, Champlain Valley School District, prior to working for the city of Winooski, and they also are engaging in that work. They hired an e equity director um, this past year that is beginning this school year as well. And so I think, you know, they've really started to dive deep and think about, you know, the 6,000-something students um, and adults that they have in their district and how their policies and how the way that they conduct business and the way that they present their educational opportunities are really geared towards the people who are privileged in their communities. And so they really want to try to change that and make those opportunities available for everyone. So really, I feel like that's what this is about. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I was, man, like, I was I one, um, we met with, I met with the, we met with the um, superintendent of schools there and the principal and the assistant principal around some issues, you know what I mean? That's uh, around just, equity and inclusion and justice and racism. And I had to bring the hard hit in there. <laughs> like, Jasmine, please come For help Winooski, me. yes, yeah, help, yes. Please come sit down with me and <laughs> help me facilitate this meeting, man. And she's like all over it. And so I want to thank you for coming in and meeting with those individuals with me, you know. And I think they learned a lot. And, I'm, and I know you still um, was, uh, had some outcome yeah. measurement, had some outcome for them. To, well, they, thanks for that invitation. I mean, it really was an opportunity for me. You know, part of my, a big part of my job, I fully believe that, um, you know, being a director of equity really means having a vast network of community partnerships yes. um, that is that are also engaging in the work so that because we all know that not not one person can do this work alone. You know, this is something that everyone needs to engage in. It's something that needs to be encouraged. And I think that you know, I wouldn't be able to do my job yeah. without having the partnerships that I do that actually I came into this position that were already established by the city of Winooski yeah. um, and the city and the school district work very closely together in all of this work as well as a lot of the community organizations, a lot of the nonprofits that help to support residents in the city. Yeah, I know one of the things that um, somebody had said at that meeting was that, um, you know, it's, you know, they're going by the policies and procedures, you know, and then and you saw we are talking about, like, well, wait a minute, you need to be trained at this yourselves. I mean, how, how do you, you know, have you had any trainings around, you know, equity and inclusion and, and you know, these type of, you know, diversity training? And I, I went, went silent, you know, and, mm. and, and then um, Yasmin was like, you know, well, I'm going to help you. Look, you know, she's going to give some key points. She's going to work with you to kind of get you some trainings or get you involved, you know, you can learn and understand about uh, uh, people who look like us and plights and feelings and attitudes and beliefs, you know, and maybe, maybe you, you can, if you can't feel none of those things, then, you know, it's okay. But at least you can get hear from somebody who does feel it and who's educated and professional like you. And so, once again, this is going to really help the city of Winooski when they go through these trainings and because it's so diverse, you know, so many different types of cultures, just like your town, um, Burlington, um, that have uh, individuals uh, who has different cultures, different beliefs, and they have um, um, 
feelings, you know what I mean? And you got to understand where they're coming from, you know what I'm saying? You really got to, it's hard to do if you're a white person, right, Aaron? It's hard to do if you don't really don't feel it, if you don't understand. Somebody say racism, racism to me, and that's, this is how this whole started, where we say racism, and they, and they look like me. I get it. They don't, have to, they don't even have to say nothing else. They said it was racism. They, it was racial, Bruce. And I'm like, right then, I feel like somebody tore something out of me. I feel like, oh, it's, it's not good. Because I, I feel you ain't got to say another word. Just use that one word. Boom. That's it. You know what I mean? I get it. You know, I feel it. I understand. Because I've been there. Been there. So, um, well, so, um, so, so a lot of things um, people were talking about on LinkedIn, I was telling you about, they were talking about where did, um, how did this come about? Equity and inclusion. Like, there's a lot of positions have been filled around the country around, these, around that title. And, yeah, so. I think people just gave it a name, you know, because it's something that has existed for a very long time. It's a need that has happened. It's a gap. It's a hole that has existed for a very, very long time. There has been injustice. There's been discrimination. There has been prejudice, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there have always been people, even prior to the equity directors of the world, who have been doing this work. You know, they were the civil rights movement, you know, the leaders of the civil rights movement in the 60s. They were the suffragettes even right. before sure. then, you know. And so there have always been folks that have recognized that the system is failing certain people within our country that are trying to lead this work. And I think that just the different generation depend, like, is, is what changes the name. But I think that it's always, it's absolutely always been there. So, so what do you think, and anybody can ask this question, what do you think, um, based on what um, Yasmin said, um, that it might not have been on the equity include, that might not have been the name, but the, basically the work has, was already there. So what would you think, um, like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X, you know, even Frederick Douglass or somebody, what do you think they, words they would have used? What do you think they I mean, how do you think, what words we could you know, I know you use, you use civil rights movement or whatever, but what do you think they, how do you think that, I'm just curious, you know. I think Malcolm think? X used, not Malcolm X, but um, Frederick Douglass used abolitionist, and that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the vein that I'm coming through as far as what we need to do to fix racial injustice is to abolish the system. Um, because the system isn't broken, it's working as it is designed. And it is designed to ensure that white people, that there's a, a racial hierarchy where white people will always land on top. And so in order to fix that system, you would have to break it, abolish it, and create something new. And so part of my work here is just doing just that, dropping those seeds for that initial breaking of the system, mm -hmm. um, and and necessary and making the necessary work and the necessary changes towards systems change. Like people think that racism is an event, it's not. Racism mm -hmm. is a system, mm -hmm. and we have to start thinking about it in that way. Because if we continue to say, "Oh, well, that was just an isolated event over here, and it's an isolated event over there," the same with the with policing and you know, um, black, unarmed black people being killed by the police. That's isolated, it's isolated, it's isolated. The masses of police don't believe in this. But it is the system that allows those things to happen. So we can't keep thinking about things as if they are just events, because they're not. Um, and racism is definitely not an event. Yes, someone can come up to me and they can say racist slurs and be racist towards me, that individualized racism does exist, but that it's the system that has allowed and nurtured and made that, that person believe that they will be able to treat me in a, in a certain way. So I think we definitely have to start thinking about abolishing some systems. I, I, I love the abolitionist like um, vibe and feel to that. Um, Malcolm X is probably one of my favorite people. My glasses are inspired by Malcolm X. Um, and so I, I listen to Malcolm X and James Baldwin and, and read a lot of Frederick Douglass' stuff just to see what were they thinking when they were trying to change the system. Malcolm X didn't want integration. I understand why. Because <laughs> um, there are still places in this country where I cannot go and be safe. I can go to places in this country right now in 2021 and be killed and no one will bat an eye. So integration does not work. It hasn't worked. Um, now, I don't know if we should be segregated or not. We are segregated. We're, we're more segregated now than we ever have been in the history of this country. So something is happening. There's a lot of backlash that's happening, and the only way to 
fix what's happening now is to abolish the systems that keep that stuff going and keep it in place. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X, by all means necessary. For That's real. right. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, you know, like, man. That's another thing, too, I, was, I had said that when I was looking at this discussions on LinkedIn, um, that people are asking, you know, um, will you know, all, these, all these positions have been, in, you know, created around the country. Um, does it mean that we really go into the back, people of color, can we really go into the back room and actually uh, help make decisions or should it be, you know, Back rooms should be closed, really. But can we? But can we still? Now we can walk back there and work with all everybody and make decisions. The world's b good now, and you know we're not forgot. We're not uh, forgotten. We're, we're Are included. We? I'm saying. Are we included? I haven't had that experience. I have some one issues of those around that. At the table. I don't. I don't. I don't believe that uh, people who was um, uh, my degree in psychology. So I, I believe that uh, it's hard to um, change the thinking that put us at, well, in, in, in theory, at risk, you know what I mean? We're, we're using the same thing to try to, using the same thinking, you know what I'm mm. saying? And so it's hard to change, uh, like you said, old, like a, you can't teach an old dog new trick, you know, you know what I'm saying? Or, how, how do you? Or the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, mm -hmm. Audrey Lorde. I don't think that, I think that a lot of, which is why I don't consider myself a DEI professional and never will, a lot of DEI professionals think that you can change the hearts and minds of people. Mm. If that were the case, slavery would not have lasted 250 years. If that were the case, Jim Crow would not have been a law of the land for decades. If that were the case, black people would have gotten full citizenship before 1968. You cannot appeal to people's psyche and people's emotions and how they believe and what they believe, but what you can do is you can change the rules to the game. Mm because people will follow the rules to the game. Mm. So that's what I mean by systems change. Mm. You know, right now it's set up where they don't have to, that, I mean, they are following the rules to the game, but it's set up so that they will always end up at the top. We want to change it so that the whole game structure changes. So now you got to learn a new game. Mm -hmm. Now you got to learn new, new language. Now you got to learn new terms. Now you got to understand that you are not the standard. Mm -hmm. My work is in decentering whiteness. To, un to make white people understand, you are not the standard for me, my household, my friends, my community. We have our own way of doing things. Other people have their own way of doing things. You, cannot no you can no longer be the standard. Because right now, the way that our government and our society is set up is that everybody is measured by the standard of whiteness. The closer you are to whiteness, the better off your life will be. That's just how it is. Whether it's skin tone, whether it's how you portray yourself in public, whether it is, you know, stepping on your own community to be closer to that whiteness, those are the ways that you can succeed in this country. I want to abolish that. And so the best way to do that is to descend to whiteness, is to remove said standard that shouldn't exist in the first place. What do you think about that, Erin? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree and, you know, a huge part of the work that needs to be done in education is to decenter whiteness as the standard and as the all of the examples and all of the cultural norms and the expectations for everyone. And I, I concur. I mean, I think that the entire education system is predicated on that concept. And, you know, I mean, I, it, it, the, I think the most recent conversation that has finally come forward um, in education that is way overdue is the stories that we tell students mm -hmm. in classrooms. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stories we tell are the stories of colonialism um, and of economic gain on the backs of people who were stolen and forced here and uh, you know that is the story that is has been told for hundreds of years in schools and and that contributes to all of this i mean you know we in in the essex westford school district our equity policy starts with a statement related to where this country came from and why we are where we are right now mm. and it is related to the the theft of land 
and the genocide of people. And, you know, to say that out loud and to change the story and to help students, especially white students and white families, understand those pieces is necessary. Har you know, I, I agree um, that it is very challenging to change hearts and minds. I will say that uh, in our educational system, part of our focus is to change the experience of students so that they grow an understanding and have skills related to identity, related to justice, related to advocacy, and social justice to ensure that they know and understand these issues as well as experience an educational system that does not entrench them. Um, so. Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you think, Yasmin? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you've got a panel full of people who all agree with each other. That, uh -huh. that's, you know, that, that's that I mean, what I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Taisha was uh -huh. saying. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't really, I think it was really well put. I'm not sure if I could have okay. put it better myself. Okay. You know, I think about in, in terms of the city of Winooski, and I think about, you know, I'm often asked the question, you know, how will we know success in this work? Like, how will we know what this is going to look like? How will we know that we have succeeded in that? And that's a really difficult question to answer because, um, you know, for me, success looks like recreating a system that is not um, static, that is uh, recreating a system that can ebb and flow and evolve with humanity as it changes and as it evolves and as we have new people coming and going from this land and, you know, we our demographics and our cities and everything, how we change. We have to create systems that can change with us. The system that we're working in hasn't changed since it since it was developed, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, and that's the challenge that we're faced with, with recreating these evolving systems. Yeah, we refer to a document that's, you know, created in 1776 as if it is gold. <laughs> um, and that same document is the same document that said J Yasmin and I are, and you, Bruce, we're are three-fifths human being. Right. So that means we're two-fifths animal. We refer to that document and we hold up the Founding Fathers as if they'd done something spectacular. But what they did, um, like Aaron was saying, was genocide. Theft of land and genocide. And, and bringing and kidnapping people and bringing them over here and torturing them for hundreds of years. Um, United Nations, yeah. United Nations Religious. describes genocide as not just, you know, death of the physical body, but death of culture, language, mm. et cetera. So all of the descendants of enslaved people, um, like myself, we don't know what our name is. Mm -hmm. We never will. Mm -hmm. They stole that from me. Mm -hmm. I will never know what my culture is, ever, because they destroyed all of that. Mm -hmm. So that is genocide of the culture that I, to which I belong. I do not belong mm -hmm. to American culture. My story started long before my family members were brought here, brought here in chains. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people need to understand that and reckon with that and deal with that. Um, this is something that I'm trying to deal with myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's tough, you know, being a people who look like us. I, I tell you another thing that was really tough for me. I, I, it really, like, I was blindsided and I was, like, uh, totally surprised that um, um, Donald Trump, who won, who won presidency, you know, and well, who just who just um, who won, and then who just lost? Um, you know, who who said that um, you know like he can grab women anywhere, that he can shoot somebody on the street and he'd be all good, and that he told his, he told everybody to storm the Capitol and where his own vice president is, you know, and he's bluntly just say out his mouth, whatever that was, this racism, all kind of things. Half of the people who voted voted for him. I'm like. How? How could that possibly happen? <laughs> how could that happen when people, when they're talking about women and this and that, how could that happen? Anybody have, how did that happen? So look to me, look how my, this country has treated no, so, its women from the time, I mean, even when God, the Independence just, Day is such a farce. It's such a farce. Like, you are celebrating, we as a country go out July 4th, here July 3rd. I don't know why they do it July 3rd, that's odd. Um, <laughs> go out, do the fireworks, have the red, white, and blue, all that stuff, and not even understanding or recognizing that the only people that were free were white men 
who owned land. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't own land, you weren't free either. And then it took hundreds of years for white women to be able to vote and have some sense of freedom and, and be able to own land and property and all of that. Look at how this country has treated anyone who is not a white man who has economic power. Even today, how does this country treat anyone who is not a white man with economic power? How do they treat their women? How do they treat their children? How do they treat black and brown people? It's, so I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised to see all those people go up to the Capitol and act a damn fool. I wasn't surprised by any of that because that's who we are. And we need to start telling the truth. Mm -hmm. What we saw on January 6th is what America is. Right. And right. we have to stop lying to ourselves. We're not the moral authority of the world. Right. We never have been. You cannot be the moral authority and have people in bondage for hundreds of years. Yeah. So I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised that Donald Trump won. I was actually surprised he lost this last time. Oh, God, I, had, I was holding my breath because I thought he was going to win again because I understand this country. I know who this country is. And that's who the country is. Wow. I remember when I was a kid, like, uh, they had, like, for Thanksgiving, they had the pilgrim, like, shaking hands with the Indians, and then the Indians got a oh, fish, because they show them how to put... And, um, and I'm glad, you know, I'm glad they stopped doing that, because what the pilgrims did to poor <laughs> Indians, you know what I'm saying? Here, thank you, here's some small blankets and smallpox, take over your land, and whatever, you know. Yeah. It, how pitiful is that? So that's the same, same type of theory and think that's still... That, how long ago has that been? What, that, what was it? When does Columbus come over here? Four, like 1492. 1492. Columbus Columbus the ocean blue. Yeah. That's that indoctrination <laughs> system. That right. is our yeah. education yeah. system that I'm right. talking about. Right. Indoctrinating right. us yeah. into a, a yeah. racist society and having us believe that we are somehow less than and having us erase yeah. all the indigenous yeah. people yeah. from that story. Right That's what I'm saying. They have, they, to date, so I, I see how they got their blinders on when he say, when Trump say, I can grab women here. I can shoot them out on the street. I can do. The, I see how white people wear these blinders, you know. Just like when President Obama, you know, we, this is this we're talking about equity inclusive, but you know, jumping in anybody in town. When Obama ran for president and won, I thought that was the worst time anybody can run for president. Three wars and mm -hmm. a recession, you know. And then the people said, "Well, he started the wars." Um, he created the recession, and the smartest thing, one of the smartest things he was doing was trying to um, was um, make the economy better. What do you call it? What? And um, and spend the money on ourselves. How smart was that? Let's build our bridges and our infrastructure. Our, you know, just re use our money, invest in that, build our own stuff. How smart is that? And then just get people to working. Um, and then, you know, they'll spend their money, revitalize the system, blah, blah, blah. I thought that was one of the smartest things he did, but one of the unsmartest things he did, but I think at the time, which I'm glad he won, was run for president with three wars, and, you know. So and the people blame that on him. All the wars and the recession, they blame that on him. Come on, man. Hmm. Well, how you got, you know, so I know, I get it. It's hard for me. My physiology, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little warm right now. I can feel myself. I, I mean, I got to, you know, you know, do use an invention. Bruce, they never had to learn about us, though. No, never. So it, it's not even, you know, at some point, I mean, you, you can blame white people, but at some point you can't. Like, if they're not racist, then they're not paying attention. Like, that means that they truly have on blinders. They have on blinders because there is no value put on understanding race. They don't even believe they have a race, you know, that their race is constructed. They don't know. And mm. it's like, no. you have Many to, people don't you know, know, that value is not Based put on there. History, they their value really is know. put somewhere else. You know, people and like And they that. don't have to do it. That's right. the thing. They don't have to learn about you. Right. They don't have to care about no. you. They don't have to love you. And that's how the system is set up. Yeah, going to school, we, didn't, we couldn't even learn about ourselves. You exactly, know I mean? indoctrination. You know, I knew everybody else's history but ours, you know. But um, so, so seeing all of that, you know, and I'm, I think I'm getting, I'm cooling off here now. Um, Good. What, what about, um, <laughs> tell me again about um, how did all that fit into, um, Aaron, how do you think all that fit into, um, like, um, equity and include, you know, um, 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 how do you think, you know, based on all these, these things, you, do you feel that, um, 
anything that's going to change besides education. I know um, uh, Taisha was saying policies and procedures. We got to change the laws. We got to we got to make them do it. But you know the the um, so you tell me what do you think about. I mean, I, I think deconstruction of policy and reconstruction of the rules is part of this work. And um, I am, I do worry a little bit about, I, I think training is important. I worry that people lean on training and then check a box and what we're really talking about are systems. The data in the education system, in my own school district, as well as in other school districts, um, the data related to the criminal justice system in Vermont um, mm -hmm. is very clear about what the rules of the game are creating. And so I think that, I think that everyone needs to begin to understand and then dive into deconstruction of policies and laws that perpetuate the inequities in the system and create redesign. I, I think if we just stay, I, I think education needs to change and we were just talking about all of that and how that needs to happen and what, what uh, representation in materials and perspectives of what stories are told and whose stories are valued and who is erased and who is showing up in the curriculum is critical and we are going to need to write policies that change that because I think related back to the like goodwill is, has never changed that story. Mm -hmm. And so we do need to create policies in education, in the criminal justice system, in public institutions, in institutions of health and mental health um, that you know, we we need to we need to revisit the system needs to revisit itself with this lens and seek and remove all creations of inequities that we yeah, can that, find. Wow. Um, I'm, yes, so. Want to do it? I, <laughs> I said, I, do you want to do it? <laughs> right? I, Who I, wants I, help? I, I, I kind of feel like we're trying to do we're doing something right now, you know. But you know. So my question to you, Yasmin, is like, if you believe in uh, changing uh, um, or amending or getting rid of policies and procedures, to, to, uh, where do you, you know, I was going to ask you the <laughs> same question. What, what, where do we, where do we start at? I mean, how, you know, I don't, God, it's so messed up, you know. I, you know, you know, like you were saying something about the Constitution, you know what I'm saying? Where do we start? We start by making sure that the decisions that are being made are represented by the people that are the most impacted by them, because that's what didn't happen from the start. You know, our founding fathers were making decisions for an entire nation full of people who didn't necessarily look like them. You know, in Winooski, we have the largest population of immigrants in all of the, I mean, I think the northeastern, northeastern sector of the New England states, and there are are we've just barely, you know, I think we're starting to scrape the to the tip of the iceberg. Winooski passed the um, the all voter registration, you know, the all so now all residents can vote in the local elections, and that's a part of it because that helps for the people who are being impacted by the policy change, being impacted by you know what is going on in the city, to be able to come to the table and put down what it is that they want. Um, and be listened to in that process. And that's a huge part of my task as well, you know, making sure that people who, that the city, that the municipality represents the city that we are serving. I think that it gets lost so often um, in government and in uh, educational structures. It gets lost that the people who are in charge are in positions of service to people, not leadership, not, you know, I don't see right. myself, I don't see myself as right. an expert, Les, Les Thaisa said, I don't see myself as an expert or, you know, the be all end all of equity. I see myself as making sure that I'm serving the community and bringing their voices to the table, making sure that our systems and our policies create space and create inclusivity to be able to have them sit in these seats right here. You know, it should be residents who are sitting in these seats. It should be the people who are living the life, right. you know, on their boots on the ground who are at the table making the decisions. It shouldn't be people from up here. You know, I'm really, I'm really focused on the grassroots kind of effort um, yeah. within the community. And for me, I feel like that's where it starts, you know, given power, literally giving power to the people. No doubt about it. And I always say, like, I work for the people who I serve, you know what I'm saying? I, they don't work for me, you know what I'm saying? And that's true, because that's why I have youth boards around the state, you know what I mean? They t tell me what they're, uh, what to do with our uh, mission goals and the 
um, objectives that they want to do, uh, programs, projects, and events. They, for, for, since uh, we created them, uniform boards, you know, remember, right? When they sit on the police commission, planning commission, school board, and all that. And um, it's got a um, new resolution to include more boards and taking away some other, some vote, uh, adding some more voting rights for the um, students. We're going to start recruiting these youth pretty soon. And so I, I get it, you know, I work for them, you know, they don't work for me, you know, I mean, I mean I'll get nothing done, you know what I mean? If I, if I t use all my little brain to try to make decisions for everybody that I work for. And so it's important, like, you, like exactly what you're saying, that we need to in boots on the ground and work, you know, work, um, go, um, listen to the people who we work for, you know. And so that, I know that's a big deal and that's a big, big step, you know, that, you know, for anybody who wants to try to get into that, it's hard sometimes, but they got to think about, they can't use their own objectives and not, they got to ask the question, you know, to people who, um, who maybe look like them or people who they serve, you know, and I know the answers are incredible. Um, so, so here we are, man. I'm like, what a big deal. I knew this was going to be a big deal for me anyways, you know, and, 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 um, and it is, you know what I'm saying? So what's going on, what's going on, what's going on in the school district? How can people get involved in trainings or volunteer or what, what is any of those things, or internships maybe? So, uh, well, in the Essex Westford School District, we're in the process of uh, creating an equity advisory committee that will be made up of students, parents, community members, um, teachers, and if appropriate administration who um, really are able to represent identities who have not had a voice at the table um, to the point that Yasmin was making. Um, I That uh, application is coming out and people should apply. The policy in the Essex Westford School District was written by a BIPOC affinity group, a black, indigenous, and people of color affinity group with a lot of intersectionality with other identities. Um, and that group of people wrote the language of the policy. It was not written by the leadership. It was not written by the school board. The school board um, ultimately is responsible for accepting, adopting, creating policy. They um, did vote that policy in and it creates space for this type of advisory group. And that advisory group is has a series of responsibilities um, to inform curriculum decisions in the district, to inform our monitoring of our progress, to inform policy decisions. Um, um, and procedural decisions, and also ultimately to write the procedure for the Essex Westford School District for the equity policy. Um, so that's that's a way for people to get involved. Um, there's a group that I co-chair with the um, Community Justice Center called Voices for Inclusion in Essex and Westford, and it's called VIEW, and that is a group that is open to community members. Our work is to hold events um, in order to to bring awareness uh, to issues of equity and inclusion across the community. We just did a, um, a community conversation centered on the book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast um, last night, actually. There's a series of events that have happened around LGBTQIA plus needs in our community. and. Um, Anyway, so that's an area for community members um, to get involved in and be active in. Um, and there's also a racial justice task force that is centering on policing in um, Essex in partnership um, with uh, the Community Justice Center and the Essex Police Department, um, given some of the needs specifically related to policing in Essex. And that um, is a group that is also available for people to reach out to. Um, you know, I don't think that any of these are the answer, and I think that um, it's just important that people become involved and use your voice and reach out to trusted people. Um, and, I, you know, it's also there's a group of people who are really anti equity as well. So it's I think it's important to call that out and say that exists and it's happening and um, it's happening in Essex and um, those conversations are um, all intertwined and we're trying to move ahead. Uh, policy is a central piece and so is education and awareness um, and there are a lot of ways to get involved. Um, and. You know, if you're interested, I'm always available for outreach. Sure. And so, uh, 
it's a lot of good work you're doing in um, your district. And um, Jill Evans is awesome, the uh, director of um, community justice, Jill Evans. Yes, Jill. She's, mm -hmm. she's um, incredible. She's awesome with mm -hmm. the community justice center. Just so you know, I'm a founding member of the justice centers across the state That's great. in 98. And so, um, so yes, I, I, w I do want to work with you and, um, and see how I can, ways I can help, you know, any, you know, I do. So we'll talk about that. So Taisha, what's, so what's how people can be like volunteer, be um, interns or, um, how can they, <laughs> what, what can they do? <laughs> well, I carry actually. Your bag, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll carry your bag. Oh, Please. thank you, thank you, but no, I, I can manage. Right. I, I actually um, just ended, well, we will be ending our summer internship program next Friday. Today, we're having a, a party for the interns. We have seven of them. Um, and, um, and we're gonna do that every summer. As far as volunteer opportunities, I'm sure there's gonna be several. We just had Juneteenth and we had over 100 volunteers for that. Wow, that was a big deal. That was, uh, that was pretty amazing. We had more volunteers and we had t-shirts and I know I ordered 100 t-shirts, so. <laughs> um, and for the volunteers, so um, that, that's gonna be gearing up soon here. We, we, it's a big event, so um, mm -hmm. last year we started planning around September. I think we should do the same again yeah, this definitely. year. Um, most of my work, though, is focused right now on the two police studies, one of which is Talitha that is finished, and the other one is uh, CNA that comes out next Friday. Well, I should have it on, on August 27th. Um, and I'll look that over with me and my team and, and get and prepare to, to release that, that information to city council. Um, we just finished our strategic roadmap that had a lot of engagement. We had BIPOC listening sessions and this whole strategic roadmap um, will inform my work for the next three to five years. So we are um, diving into that report and uh, it's a lot there. A lot of investments mm -hmm. need to be made in black and brown communities. Sure. Um, I am, I just received all of the um, grocery store gift cards today for, it's $100,000 worth of, of gift cards, 100 to $500 each. Um, I'm gonna work with multiple community partners to make sure that we do kind of like a back to school um, kick off with that, with that, those gift cards and working with Burlington Public Schools, uh, New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church, um, feed, Feeding Vermont, Feeding Chittening, um, and Vermont Food Bank. And like we have all these different partners that are gonna help us sure. distribute these cards to the people who need them the most. Um, the reason behind that program is that I know what it's like to be hungry. I was that person, that, that kid that had to stand in line and wait for a box of food and you don't know what's in it. And it's most, more often than not, it's not culturally appropriate. So I wanted to give people a little bit of dignity back um, to be able to shop the way that they want to shop for their children and also be able to buy things more than just food. Right. Um, you know, school supplies, whatever it is that they need. So two grocery stores are involved in this effort. That's Hannaford's and City Market. Um, we got the money from donations from Vermont Community Foundation and the Vermont Federal Credit Union. Awesome. Um, and so they are financially backing this effort. And hopefully next week we'll start handing out some cards. I had a great That's time awesome. at, um, <laughs> at um, <laughs> Juneteenth event. Thank you for all, that. that's incredible. It was really good work and let me know how I can help you, you know, any ways you think I'm, I, I'm the best at, you know. Um, yes. So I had fun at Juneteenth event. I was at the, I uh, was at the Roosevelt Park one. Yeah. And I was hanging out with the mayor and he was hanging out and listening to Louis Cauldron on the stage. That's my friend Louis. And, Wow, my friend, uh, Louise McCool did a double dutch. She, she's like, we're going to, I'm, she's going to do double dutch. It was really a big <laughs> yes. deal, you know? And it was so nice. The day was the best. Thank it was you. a beautiful day, that day. Yeah, it was. And, uh, it was, it was so nice. And, um, and so, yes, please do that. I don't know how many people were there, but God, it was uh, thousands. <laughs> was yeah, a lot of people. that's what and it seemed like it anyway. I, we, had, we had five different locations, so. Yeah, yeah I know, um, I know. I don't have an accurate count, but know, there were tell, a lot you know? of people um, coming crowded. through there. And so I just want to tell you too, Aaron. Uh, I was at the, the SS one with uh, we saw that was nice too. I was yeah. there with the chiefs and the we saw the yeah. human and economic development director at, for SS, and we had a great. I read great. a little story out of the book, you know. Yeah. So that was cool as well, and. Um, and I was at the Winooski one with my friend. Thank yeah. you for hooking that up. <laughs> See, it was nice. So I went to all three because I got to represent my, my Winooski in my, my town. 
when I was asked to do some things at the other ones. So, um, so how can people? Can you, can you, how can people get involved with the Winooski um, equ Equity and Inclusion Program, volunteer? Um, just tell me. So really what, you know, the way that people can get involved in Winooski, we're still kind of, uh, you know, we're, we're a little bit, we're new to all, <laughs> we're new to this work right now. You know, I came on in May, and so we had the Juneteenth celebration, which was most, was very much largely put on by downtown Winooski. I don't want to take credit for that yeah. because they had, you know, pretty much organized it by the time I even started the job. And so they asked me, of course, you know, if I wanted to be a part of it, and I did. Um, but they did a, they did a great job. There it was it a wonderful little celebration, and I think the people of Winooski really appreciated it. Um, but so what we're focused on right now in Winooski is. Um, um, conducting a, uh, an audit study of the city and of our services and of kind of how the municipality serves the community. And so we have hired um, we have hired a consultant that is from Washington, D.C. that is going to come in and for the next five months they are going to conduct right. a citywide equity audit. There are going to be ample um, opportunities for community input. I really enjoy this, um, this consultant in the way that they're approaching this work. They are very much focused first on outcomes and then they work backwards to find out why the policies, why the structure is not meeting the outcomes. And so the focus of the audit is going to be on um, listening to the community, similar to kind of what Burlington did with listening sessions, focus groups, community night, community input nights, um, many, many opportunities for residents to come to the table and really, you know, very honestly let folks know how the city is doing and what their needs are that are not being addressed and not being fulfilled. Um, and then that is all going to happen this fall. So if folks want to get involved in that, there are going to be plenty of opportunities that are going to be starting in the month of September. Um, and we're working really hard with um, other, you know, with some nonprofit organizations to make sure that we can, um, that we can compensate folks who come to be involved in those situations because a lot of them, you know, we're going to do our best to make sure that we cast a really wide net and make it available to everybody in, you know, multiple, through multiple pathways. Um, but we would really like to reward, we really like folks um, who are participating in that to be compensated for their time. And so, you know, we'll be looking, we'll be making a really big effort um, to look for donations for that purpose as well. Um, and as part of that is going to be funded through the Working Communities Challenge Grant that was awarded to the mm -hmm. city specifically for this work. Um, and so I'm really excited about this effort. It's been, um, you know, a really interesting process not having a city manager. Um, <laughs> well, as I came into the job, our wonderful city manager left the week that I began. And so we've had, you know, two wonderful staff members who have been co-interim city managers on top of their regular duties. But um, I think it, it, you know, that's also an opportunity that we that the city has right now um, that is going to be fulfilled. I think that position is going to be filled in the month of September. So I think that once that position comes in, um, they're going to be very supportive of this work as well, and we're going to be able to um, to do a lot more than we have, you know, over the summer. Um, and then the second focus that we're really, of course, working on is you know, getting the city clerk's office ready for the next election cycle uh -huh. because we now have the new charter for right. all resident voting. Um, and so that is going to be a big focus of the equity audit as well is to really make sure that we create a system that is going to be inclusive in that way to get as many people to the ballot box as possible. Um, so that is going to, you know, that's going to include elements of education for the community, you know, prior to. Um, it's going to include elements of encouraging um, residents to to run for positions, to run for city council, to run for you know um, positions within mm -hmm. the within the city, um, and so you know there's going to be a really really large push um, and effort to get people informed in that process as well, and that's all kicking off next month. So, thank you for the informative information. So I'm going to ask uh, you guys one more question. You can add to any anything you can you can uh, add. Say anything you want. You know after this question. Um, so, first, to let you know, I'm, I'm the Democratic ch Chairman, or Democratic Party Chairman for Winooski. Mm -hmm. um, in case you want, you know, want me to help you with anything, or you know people who might be interested in running for certain positions, I'd like to talk with them. 
Um, so, uh, as a, one of the commissioners, I helped I help plan, put the, you know, help approve some of the master plan. That's now. Is, how is the equity and inclusion going to be put in part of that master plan that we're doing? So the equity inclusion, um, there are pieces of the master plan. There actually is an entire section in the okay. master plan that is targeted towards equity and inclusion for the city of Winooski. And that was developed um, during, you know, that was a, a result of the equity summit that they had in 2018, mm -hmm. which is really kind of the kickoff for right. all of this work. Um, so there's actually an entire, I believe that there is a resolution within our master plan that talks about being able to bring our more underrepresented and marginalized voices to the table. Part of that strategic plan was the creation and the hiring of my position. Right, I know. Well, so, all right, so thank you. <laughs> and so, Taisha, what about um, uh, racial, you know, inclusion within the BTV plan? The strategic plan, the strategic roadmap, yeah. Um, you're asking about uh, what's in it. I mean, uh, is, is anything about racial and um, equity and inclusion of, and diversity? Or? Yeah, all of my work is about racial racial justice. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, I don't deal with other parts of diversity. Yeah. My focus is um, solely on race. Um, sometimes you have intersections that, that come with that. But uh, for the most part, my focus is, is solely and only on race yeah. and racial justice. Is that part? Of, is that going to be in the, in the BTV plan? Is that in the plan? That's that was in my job when I accepted the job right. when I was still in Minnesota. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> that was that was yeah. my right. desire to only work on race and no, not to it. add in part. in all parts. Now yeah. I am a woman. Uh, I am a lesbian, so I do have other intersections. I do have a disability. I have all these intersections, right. but my focus and my my specialty is on race and racial justice. Forgot about it. And we need you right we need you to be wherever you want to be, especially on race, because you are very knowledgeable and I appreciate your talents and professionalism. And I'm glad to know you. <laughs> <laughs> you. I will call you every time. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I guess got to. So Aaron, what about the Essence plan? I looked at it and I, I got a big yeah. book this thick about the plan. So uh, um, are you asking about the municipality component or the I school know district? If, um, Equity and inclusion, is that in, in the it's plan? It's in both, I believe, yeah. although my expertise is specifically with the Essex Westford School District. And the Essex Westford School District Continuous Improvement Plan has um, an underlaying foundation of equity at its core, uh, which is why that policy was so critical. Um, and, you know, Essex for a while was not inclined to situate leadership in a position specific. We were talking about that earlier. We did end up doing that. Um, but the reason that that held for a little bit uh, at the inception of the plan was because it's everyone's work. Mm -hmm. well. You can't, you know, and if it is only everyone's work and there isn't a clear structure to move forward and a plan that clearly expects forward movement, we know historically that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so yes, the plan has a substantial component of um, equity and inclusion at its core and uh, also all the way around it um, and, and touches each and every person. One of our primary focus points for this year is diversifying the educator workforce as well as the staff workforce and especially leadership and and the school board um, you know the, the the diversification of each of those entities is really really essential um, to shifting um, and, and that's about hiring it's about our practices it's about the rules and the ways that we consider lived experience um, in the in, or don't ex consider it in the interview process so, oh, yes, it's all inclusive. There's a nine-part equity plan with, for the Essex Westford School District that's available in, online um, that people can take a look at. It includes the relationship between the school district and the police. It includes professional development. It includes student voice. It includes curriculum auditing. Um, it's yes. So the answer is yes in lots of ways. Well, thank you. I want to thank all, all of my wonderful guests, Jasmine, Taisha, and Aaron, for joining our show, Straight Talk for Month show. Thank you, Bruce. And this uh, has been great. I know. I learned a lot. And Thanks I'm, for and having I'm sure us. once this airs, we'll, a lot of people will learn a lot, too, you know. Mm -hmm. and so thank you, Bruce. Please, let me know how I can help you. You know, you know i got to help you, you know what I mean? Just 
Like I said, I'll just carry your bags, whatever. I have no problem with it. You say, Bruce, come take me to lunch. I'll do it. I promise you. I'll take you up on that one. <laughs> There's a lot of good I'm places about to, to go eat. Have some tacos right down yeah. the street right now if you want to go down there. So, all right. Thank you for joining the Straight Talk Vermont show, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye. <laughs>